This is a crash course, which means we don't have much time. So let's hurry up and take a look at exactly what we're going to be building today. Ah yes, very nice. A simple yet elegant web page for a fictional business. And I'm not going to show you just how to design it by placing elements in certain areas. I'm going to show you the why as well. We'll be using Adobe Figma for this, as Figma has been the most popular UI UX design software for years now. Needless to say, you will learn a lot about the features and workflow of Figma. Now, you want to know something that's really cool about this particular project? Well, I also show you how to use HTML and CSS to realize this project in the browser. We won't be doing that in this video today. That's for another Crash Course video on front-end development that will be linked here once it's ready. And finally, the purpose of this Crash Course is to help you get your feet wet. If by the end of watching this video, you think to yourself, you know what, I'd really like to learn more, then it'd be the perfect time to join my interactive UI UX course at designcourse.com. All right, that's enough talking, let's get started. All right, so here I am in Figma, and after you create an account and you log in, you'll see a UI similar to this. I have a ton of projects, these are from like students that I, I uh, revise you know, their, their design submissions, um, but you might have something that's completely empty, in which case you're probably gonna see buttons to create a new design file. Uh, so we wanna click this, we wanna create a new design file. So I'm gonna click on that. All right, and here we are. Now I'll briefly go over the UI of Figma here. And essentially, it's pretty simple. I, it's not something crazy like you know Adobe After Effects or Premiere or anything like that. Um, if we come up here, we see we have this uh, layers and assets uh, panel right here. All your layers are gonna show up over here. We'll have assets like your components and stuff that'll show up here. We have a toolbar up here and um, the frame tool, you'll see that in a second. That's kind of how, that's, that's basically where we design our user interface. Um, we have shape tools and drawing tools like here. Uh, we have the, the dreaded pen tool, we're gonna use that. Uh, we have the type. Um, we have resources like where you can access components, plugins, and widgets, uh, and some comment tools. Uh, if you have people working on a file you, and you know, you're working back and forth, uh, and then the hand tool, you'll see how this all comes into play as well. Um, then over here, pretty simple enough, we have what's called a property inspector over here. A lot of the design apps follow the same sort of pattern. When we, when we, when we select an element like a piece of type or a shape or whatever, you're gonna see a bunch of properties right here associated with it. Um, we have tabs as well, design. So this is where your property inspector is, shows up, but also a prototype tab. And that means adding interactivity like animations and stuff like that. And we'll get into that as well. And then inspect, I personally never use inspect. Don't worry about it. Uh, it'll just like show you CSS code and stuff like that. But I always do that by hand. I don't use this stuff anyhow. Um, up here we do have share so you can share it with people um, and then a play button so you can play your prototype especially if you've interact if you've integrated prototyping into it all right so let's go ahead and get started the first thing you're going to do is get the frame tool out up here all right you want to click this or hit F on your keyboard then you're gonna notice over here we have all of these you know in the property inspector we have all these different um, frame uh, preset sizes. So if you wanna start with phone, go ahead. I personally, when I'm starting with the UI, I always start designing with desktop first. It's the full, uh, it's the whole, it's the whole, what do you wanna call it? The whole shebang. <laughs> and it's just easier to work uh, from, you know, realizing the full experience of the, the layout and then working your way down to tablet and mobile uh, than doing the reverse, all right? So we're going to choose desktop 1440 by 1020 right here, all right? So real quickly, also before we start actually designing, um, movement. I wanna talk about some keyboard shortcuts real quickly that you need to get into the habit of using. You're gonna see me flying all over the place and zooming. Uh, first off, if you hold the space bar, uh, and you left click, you can drag around, all right? Very, something I use very often. Um, using your mouse scroll wheel, you can go up and down. And then also to zoom, you can hold your control or command on Mac and your mouse scroll wheel to zoom in and out. Those are the three main things that I use the most to really start zipping around here. <laughs> so try to remember that. Obviously, the more you practice, you're gonna bake it into your muscle memory. All right, so 
If we select right up here uh, on the actual frame name, we're able to select the canvas or the frame as it's called here. And this is basically your container of your, your website. Um, over here, you'll notice in the property inspector, there's a bunch of different properties. So you can change the width and height manually over here. Um, you can adjust uh, the X and Y position of where it's at on here. I don't ever do that. Um, we can add an auto layout, a layout grid. We'll get into these things. Um, a fill, almost a lot of the things that you uh, select, you're able to change the, the color, the background color. You're, right, you're able to add strokes, effects, and all that good stuff. So this is something that shows up for most of the items that you will select that show up here in the product, property inspector. So if you wanna change your website background and it wants to be a different color, this is where you would change it right here. Us, we wanna keep it white for this example. All right, another thing that we wanna do is add a layout grid. All right, so we just click on this or click the plus and you can see we have this red sort of squares all over the place. I wanna change that to columns and notice it says five for our column count right here. We're gonna change that to 12. And then we're gonna increase the margins uh, from zero to about 140. All right, so what does this do exactly? Well, essentially this sets you up um, with a grid system which you can use to help you piece together your layout. Now me personally, I ignore all 12 of these. The only reason I use these is just to make sure that the very beginning of my design I, and the very end of the design to, the, to this side, it has equal amount of white space from, let me zoom up, from here to here and compared to here to here, all right? Uh, so really what I could do is take this layout grid, the layout grid and change the count to one. <laughs> and that's all I really personally use it for. Okay, and then we can toggle this on and off um, with that little eye icon. So now the first thing I usually get started with is the header, the navigation, all right? So when it comes to UI design, there's many different patterns that have been established. And especially when you're a beginner, you should stick with. Uh, and I'm gonna stick with the most common pattern for having a desktop header or nav bar or navigation. And that is to have your logo on the left, the upper left corner, and then to the right, you'll have a navigation. All right, so let's do that. Um, I'm going to have a resource file where you can take, the, you, you can download it here in the YouTube description. Just click it, it's gonna be a zip file and you'll be able to extract those files onto a folder on your desktop or wherever, and you're gonna be able to follow along with me, and one of those assets is gonna be the logo, all right? So the logo, um, all you have to do is, uh, if you're working on just one monitor, just make sure this window isn't maximized, and then you can view a folder, and then you can go ahead and just drag on that logo file, it's probably gonna be called logo.svg, and it'll show up here, just like this. All right, now I have mine pretty much, when I pasted it, perfectly in exact position of where I want it. Yep, it is. And notice it's right along this, this line right here. So if I move this over, it's right there. All right, and that's what we want. We're, call, we're calling this fictional company Foxica Premium Apparel, all right? Now notice, this is where we're gonna get into some UI design fundamentals. We don't wanna put it right up here because that's too close to the top. And that is a concept called white space, all right? This is way too close to the top. And this is way too close to the top. This would be too far down. So there's a, there's a, a, a sweet spot, so to speak. And where you place this logo, it's gonna depend on a few factors, but right around here is gonna be pretty good. Uh, and one of those factors is also gonna be your navigation and what else is around it but right around here is pretty solid. Now, if you wanna follow along and be exact based on what I'm doing, here is a pro tip. We hold Alt, and you can see these little red uh, lines that appear. It's probably hard to, for you to see it, but they're numbers, and they're in relation to other elements that might be around it. In this case, it's just, there's no other elements, there's just the frame, so it's 36 pixels away from the top here and we have 100 uh, 
38 away from the left here. So you can kind of get things positioned uh, using that metric. And it's also handy for when you're doing HTML and CSS and CSS specifically, when you're trying to do a pixel perfect representation of the design when it's realized in the browser. All right, so, and we're gonna get to that in that course as well. So now we're gonna have our actual navigation, all right? And we're just gonna have four links and it's gonna be simple. Now it's gonna take a while for us to knock out this navigation because I need to cover a bunch of concepts that don't just apply to navigations, but a lot of other design topics as well. All right, so here's what I mean. We're gonna hit T on the keyboard or come up here and just select the type tool and we're going to left click and I'm going to type in home. All right, now by default, if I zoom up here, remember control scroll wheel, if I select this, we'll see over here we have fonts that we, we can use. This is called enter. I wanna change that font to a different font called Poppins, P-O-P-P-I-N-S. All right, it's my favorite font. <laughs> so we're gonna stick with that. Now you can see as well, um, over here, we can change the font weight, like we can make it bold if we want, which I don't want to. Uh, we do wanna change the font size. And for me, let me look at my reference here, my reference design. I wanna make sure I'm following along exactly. Yep, we're gonna change this to 16. So 16, hit enter, and it makes it a bit bigger. Um, over here, we also have other things like where we can adjust the line height. We have multiple lines of text. We have letter spacing, paragraph spacing, all this type-based stuff. Uh, we can center the text and all this good stuff. Um, what I do wanna do is come over here to type settings and we want to, right here under case, the very last option, we wanna click this one. We wanna make it all uppercase. Now, why would I do that? Well, it's just a subjective preference uh, that, I'm, that I'm basically establishing. You could leave it normal, uh, where it's just like you know the, re the regular title case, or you could have it all caps lock. So there's a lot of subjective preferences that we can make. Now, I'm gonna show you something. You don't have to follow along with this, this, uh, this point, but I wanna show you the, the inefficient way of, cr of creating a navigation, and I'm gonna show you the much, much better way of creating a navigation. So let's say for example, we have home. Now, how did I do that by the way? You take it, you select the, the element by left clicking, we hit control D or command D on Mac to duplicate and then we just hold shift and move it over. Holding shift will make sure it stays on that same horizontal axis right here. All right, so we move it over, we type in products um, let's say we also have gallery. Notice there's also a little, uh, little helper tips, so to speak, where it tells you, oop, that's, that's uh, even white space between those three elements. So that's good. Now let's, let's just make gallery. Again, you don't have to follow along. Um, what happens if, for example, somebody, um, maybe your boss says, we need to change products uh, and we need to rename that to services or service. Guess what? We have an e uneven amount of white space now between this element and this element. It's bigger. I, so this is an inefficient way of creating a navigation. We're gonna use something called components and auto layout. That's gonna make our life a lot easier, especially when it comes to the inevitability of sometimes having to revise a design based on a client or a boss telling you what to do. So. Uh, what we're gonna do before I show you, you know, th those things like components and also auto layout, I'm going to add an underline, all right? Because when it comes to navigation design and UI UX design, you should always have an active status for one of the nav items. So in this case, we're designing a homepage, so we're going to make it obvious for the user that we're currently on the homepage. How do you do that? You have different options on how you could do that. You could change the color, you could change the font weight by making it bold or something like that. You can use an underline, you can use an icon, and sometimes you can do multiple of those things together. You can even give it a background. So I'm gonna choose, and this is a subjective preference, to go ahead and add a line. So we're gonna take the line tool up here, you just click the down and just hit L, you could do that instead. And I'm going to hold shift and left click and drag. 
and create kind of something like, yeah, maybe I'll make it go in a little bit more. Something like that or so. Now, another thing to note is if you wanna change the thickness of that element, you can go ahead and select it and you can change that thickness right here where it says one. So maybe you want it to be 1.5. That's fine as well. All right, me, I'm just gonna leave it one. And of course you could change the stroke color, all this other stuff I'm here in the property inspector. I'm just gonna leave it pretty much like that. Okay, so now that we have the active state version of the button designed, we're gonna take both of these elements and this is real important to remember when you're creating navigations like this, we first wanna go ahead and here, let's go ahead. I'm gonna drag that just down a tad bit. There we go. We wanna make sure the, this bounding box from this type isn't overlapping this. That way we can select both, holding shift and left clicking both, and we can choose auto layout right up here. All right, so we click that. Now, not much has really changed. Now, auto layout allows you to do a couple things. So if I move this over here and I zoom up, Essentially, what auto layout will allow us to do now, now that these two elements are in what's called an auto layout, is we could do all sorts of interesting things. Like we could change it from a vertical direction to a horizontal direction. And now that's move this over here to the right side automatically. Um, we can also adjust the spacing between these elements by left clicking and dragging this value. I don't want to do that. Um, you can change horizontal padding vertical padding, and you have options to adjust all four of the padding options here. And then over here, you can see we have a center alignment element uh, in, in an area where we can start to align these things in different fashions. And you'll see how this kind of works going forward. Um, so then once you've created this auto layout for the nav item itself, we can now go ahead and create a component. Components are very a very important topic to understand. Let me tell you why. You don't have to follow along with this portion. So I'm gonna go ahead and duplicate it, uh, duplicate that with Control D. And let's say, for instance, you know we have our nav items here, and I uh, we or your boss or a client says I want you to change the color of these links. We don't want black. We're gonna use something else, maybe like a blue. So I come here and I wanna change these all to blue. All right, now I have to do it individually or select all of them and do it and it's a pain. I, a component negates that necessity. All right, so here's what I'm talking about. To create a component, we select the element that we have and it's right up here. You can click on this button and it'll say create, create component or control alt K for the shortcut. When you do that, it basically outlines it in a purple element and also in the layers panel, it's purple as well. So we can come over here, double click that and change that to nav item. All right, I'm bad about naming my layers or renaming them rather, so whatever. You should get in the habit of doing that. Um, and so now we have what's called a component. Now with this component, if I duplicate that and I go over here and I change the color on the master component or the initial component that was created, this here is an instance of it. Uh, if I wanna change the color, guess what? That changes too. And we could also do things like come over here and change it to bold. And guess what? That becomes bold. So it's a very handy way, components are, of um, allowing you to revise things easily that are supposed to be the same, all right? Now, next topic, component variants. Remember what I said, we, we, have, we wanna have an active state, but also a state without this little underline, right? Correct. So, we use component variants to achieve that. So, we created a component up here, remember? But now, with that selected, you can see it's changed the icon to a little plus. Before it was like this diamond shape, but now it has a plus in it and it's called add variant when we hover over it. We click on that and then that happens. 
this thing happens. Like, wait, what? I don't want that in my design. Well, that's why when you're creating component variants, they are not to be residing within your main UI frame right here. They're gonna go somewhere else. Sometimes people create extra pages. So if I come over here and show you, notice we're on page one. Uh, we can just double click this and change that to home page. Uh, we can have another page called components by clicking plus right here and we can just store all of our components and component variants over there. I'm not gonna do that because it's just a simple project. I'm gonna store them in the same page. You can do that as well. So I'm gonna create a new frame, F on the keyboard. And we're just gonna draw out a random size and we're gonna drag this right there. All right. And if you want, you can be cool and hit the type tool and you can give it a label if you want. You don't have to, you know, you can say this is a main navigation items. You know, we can just give that a label, maybe make it pretty small. Yeah, something like that. And now we ha uh, have this frame in which we can start working with and constructing our component variants. So we're gonna need a few of them because I also wanna have a hover state. So on desktop, when people are using with their mouse and you hover over something that's like an actionable, clickable item, you should also have a hover state, which again, that could be denoted by changing something like the color, uh, an underline, adding an underline, uh, making a bold, whatever. So what we're gonna do here is we could see this one, if we select it under the property inspectors, we can see it where it says property one is default. Uh, we're gonna change that to active because that's our active state. Let me get out of here. Oop, there we go. So this is our active state and there's only ever gonna be one active link because there's only one page a person can be on at the same t at, the, at a time. Now, when it comes to here, home, I, the second one, this is going to be the default state uh, where it's not the active page and it's also not being hovered over, all right? Now, before I make changes to this, I'm gonna duplicate that and we're gonna make a change. This is gonna be our hover state, this third one. So for our hover state, I'm gonna double click to get access to this line right there. It is selected and we're gonna change the stroke color to like a mid gray or something like that. So 8C, 8C, 8C is the color code if you wanna follow along, all right? Now, if I can come up here to this middle one, this is going to be the default state one. Oh, and by the way, let's go ahead and click on this and we'll change over here, variant three to hover, all right? And then this one is gonna be our default state. So we're, we'll change that to default for the property one name. And then we're gonna go ahead and double click and gain access or control I uh, and left click to gain access to this. And we're going to shrink this sucker all the way down to its small size. And then also come over here where it says pass through and change that to 0%. Now, when we do that, it's hidden. You cannot see it. Basically it's taking the opacity and says, goodbye, we're not gonna see you. Now, we're going to prototype this middle one so that when we hover over this element, it's going to smart animate into this, which basically means it's gonna morph into this. We're gonna see this line come from nowhere and grow into this, this uh, gray line on hover. We're gonna achieve this in the HTML and CSS as well in that video, uh, which I hope you will watch. So how do we do that prototyping? We come up here to prototype and with that element selected, which it currently is, we're gonna add an interaction. So we click plus, we click this click, and then this is gonna be while hovering. So we want this thing to occur while the mouse is hovering over that element that's currently selected. So while hovering, what are we going to do? Uh, well, let's see here. We're gonna drag this here, all right? So while hovering, it's gonna change to property one hover. Notice this is pointing to the hover element. And then, then we also wanna make you smart animate. Instant will make it uh, not animate. It's just gonna show up this, this uh, gray bar or gray line immediately without any type of transition you know, animation occurring. If we do smart animate, it will create uh, a nice smooth growing effect on that line. And we have properties down here like the duration, 300 milliseconds, that's fine. The easing, which will affect how fast it comes in or how slow it you know, goes out and all that stuff. And then that's it. 
So now I, what we can do is how do we get this, this new uh, component variant onto here? All right, well, we can come over here to assets and then we'll see frame one and then we'll see this nav item. That's what we wanna left click and drag over here. And there we go. Notice it's outlined in that purple and by default, it's on our active state. We can choose to make it not active by coming over here with it selected first and changing it to default. Guess what, that goes away. All right, so let's bring that back though because we want our home element, that's our first nav element. We want that to be the active state. Now, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna duplicate it, Control D, hold Shift, move it over. Somewhere right around here looks fine to me. Amount of, and again, the amount of white space you have between your nav items is very important. You don't want them to be too close because they might accidentally click on one they didn't intend to, or you don't want them to be too far and like really spread out to where they don't feel like they're a cohesive element. So I'm just gonna put somewhere around here and we'll be able to adjust this white space easily because guess what? We are gonna select both of these and put those in an auto layout as well. So we click plus, all right, notice that it, knew smart, it was smart enough to know that this is a horizontal direction because we're having a horizontal navigation. Uh, and then if you wanna adjust the uh, spacing, we can just take this and move it in and out. Very handy stuff using auto layout. So now what I can do is for this one, we double click into it to select that instance and we can go ahead and change property one to default. Now what's really cool is we can also double click and change this to products. Oh no, why is that happening? We definitely don't want that to happen. So what happened that caused this issue right here? All right, so if you wanna make changes to some of the properties of your components, you can't adjust some of those properties at the component instance level. Up here is where our main component resides, or the master component essentially, or the parent component. And so essentially, what we wanna to do to fix that is to select our type, and we have type options right here. You see this one? This one's selected, where it says fixed size. We want auto width, all right? And we're gonna to have to do that for the other ones as well. So I'm just control left clicking to, to gain access to those and we're gonna do auto width for all those. Guess what, it fixed it. So make sure you do that. That was a bad on my part, but I'm glad it happened just to show you how to modify things. Another thing I did not tell you about is when we have our, our sibling uh, or our instances of components, if we make changes to one of those, like the color of the font, it only it only changes that component instance. So whereas if we adjust the parent component over here, it's gonna affect all of them. Okay, enough talking. Now, let's duplicate this again, and we're going to create yet another link called gallery. Duplicate that, and then we'll make that contact. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. I might wanna add a little bit more white space, like a 41 between them. Now we can bring back, if we select our frame right there, we can bring back our columns, make sure this is right aligned right there. So we have equal white space or the empty space, the very left or to the very right of the design compared to the very left of the design. Very important, alignment is one of those key fundamentals that you need to learn. So we can go ahead and hide that. All right, now watch this. If we select this frame, hit the play button on the upper right corner, we can see that animation take place. It's hard to see, so I'm gonna zoom up, control four, look at that. So this becomes quite powerful uh, when you use it in different contexts, which we're going to as well. I know it's very simple right here, but you're gonna see it's very powerful and a cool way to prototype. And it's something that can be achieved with CSS, which I will show you in that crash course video for HTML, CSS, and front-end development. All right, so this right here, we're almost done with the navigation. Now what happens, for instance, if we duplicate this and we have another page, or you create another page over here in that panel and 
you know, maybe you have the products page you're designing for. Well, you're gonna have a replication of this, this nav bar, essentially. And what happens if you wanna make a change or your boss wants you to make a change or a client wants you to make a change to a logo? It means you have to change it in all these other areas manually. Well, remember what we do to negate that, we use components. So let's delete that. We're gonna take both of these elements. First, before we create a component, we can also use auto layout here. And I'll tell you why it would make sense to use auto layout. Let's say for instance, uh, you don't have to follow along. I'm gonna hit frame, I'm gonna get a tablet. I uh, will get an iPad mini right here. And we duplicate this and we come over here. Well, guess what? If we, I did not create a, a auto layout out of that, we would have to find this one and manually drag it over. Well, guess what we can do here? We can essentially reduce the space between the elements right there in the property inspector. So much better, but they're not components. Uh, so after you create the auto layout, we can now click up here to create a component or control alt K. And now that is a component. All right, so if we go back to the layers, we can change, we can double click on it. Where for me, it says frame three. It might say something else for you. We're gonna call this nav bar. Okay. Awesome, awesome stuff. So now the navigation's done. Uh, that's exactly what we want. It looks good and it's rocking. Now let's get started with what's called, commonly referred to as a hero section. All right, the hero section is underneath the navigation typically, 99.9% .9 of the times, and it contains a few key things that you'll see on many websites. Uh, it's gonna have a headline or a big piece of type uh, it's gonna have a subheadline usually, like a description of some sort. It'll have a call to action, which simply means you know a primary button. They're, they're trying to get you to click. It could be a form, could be getting you to enter an email, et cetera. And then usually there's an illustration somewhere. Um, we're gonna have kind of like a gallery of three different images. So let's get started on that. And we're gonna get started, and I typically start with the headline. All right, so we're gonna take the type tool, T on your keyboard for the shortcut, and we're gonna say quality up. And right now it's remembering the type settings from before. So if I come back here and we change this just to this dash as type, that will be most preferable. So now we can see it's fixed that. We're gonna say quality apparel, is that how you spell it? I hope it is, I'm not sure. Without the price tag. Apparel is one of those words that I just not exactly certain how to spell. Now with this selected, we're gonna change the font to a font called Playfair Display. Just hit enter when it auto fills. And it's kind of like a nice serif font, all right? So we need this to be big. Now this is a UI design fundamental or principle, if you will, called visual hierarchy. It sounds scary, sounds complex, it's not. Let me tell you why. Essentially, visual hierarchy is using all these UI, other UI design fundamentals such as scale, color, proximity, white space, to place emphasis on elements that we deemed are high priority. A headline, is one of the most high priority elements of a design in a hero section because it's usually the first thing that you want a person to read. And if you want them to read something first, one of the biggest UI fundamentals that you use at your disposal to ensure proper visual hierarchy on that element is size. In this case, it's a piece of type, it's text, it's gonna be your font size. So 16 is way too small. Like this gets overshadowed even by the logo. We need this thing to be big. So let's try something like 52. Now, look what happens. We're much easier able to see, Here's here it is at 16. Obviously you're gonna read this first compared to something like this. So it's a very important process of understanding visual hierarchy, and it's not just achieved through font size. Like I said, it's also through color, proximity, white space, contrast, the list goes on. All right, so with this type selected, I don't want this to go all the way out and there's a lot of subjective ways we could lay out this layout or piece together this layout, so to speak. 
Like we could take these, uh, we could center it, and the way you can align certain items based on your selection is up here. So if we wanna center it within the given frame or the layout, we can just click that. We can also center it vertically and all that good stuff. This right here, quality apparel without the price tag, we could put maybe another sub headline underneath it and have like a picture. You could piece it together like that and it would be a subjective thing. I, For those of you who might not be familiar with, uh, you know, English might not be your first language, I subjective simply means opinion, your own preference. Objective though would be 100% concrete, you must do this or you must not do this. Uh, so there are objective things when it comes to UI design and there are subjective things, many more subjective things I would say. So I, we're not gonna center align this. I'm gonna put this right back over here. Notice how I'm making sure it's aligned on the same column. And by the way, if you hit Shift R, you'll get these little rulers at the top and left. You can left click and drag them on there just so you can quickly visualize things, okay? And then if you just hit Shift G, or not Shift G, I'm sorry, or Shift R, you can toggle those on and off. Okay, so another thing I, I wanna do, and this is a very common pattern for creating hero sections, is have basically two columns. A column here with our type and our call to action, and then a column here, which will have like a gallery or illustration or photograph of some sort that supports this section. So what I'm gonna do is just left click and drag this right there. All right, so now we have two lines for a headline. Next up, we're gonna have a subheadline. So I'm gonna control D to duplicate that and we can move it down holding shift. Now, here's another way to, this is another tip to replicate things. You can hold alt and just move it down as well. It's up to you. So now we're gonna have what's called a subheadline, and this is just gonna be a supporting piece of copy as it's called. Uh, and when it comes to visual hierarchy between these two pieces of type, in this case, we'll get real fancy and call it typographic visual hierarchy. We want the sub the subheadline to not be as important as the headline. So how do we do that? Because clearly if we just put in, we start typing a, a, a subheadline like no need to spend XXX on apparel just for the name's sake. Uh, our premium apparel is made from the same stuff. Okay, now if you left it like this, that would be bad because there's nothing differentiating these two elements from each other and they lack visual hierarchy. They're, they're on the same footing essentially. So how do we remedy that? Again, the, the most primary way is gonna be font size. So we're gonna change that font size to 18 from 52. There we go, much better. Now, uh, proximity is very important. And for those of you who are feeling uh, adventurous, <laughs> which I typically don't advise for most newbie or newcoming UI designers, we can also create more of a distinction with the visual hierarchy between these two elements by changing the font family itself between these two elements. So for this, I'm going to do that and we're gonna change it to Poppins, which is used up in the navigation. All right, now this is set at a regular font weight. Another way you can establish that visual hierarchy is to change it to a different, maybe a lighter font weight, to light. So I changed it to light, it is 18, and it is Poppins. Those are the three changes that we made. And now you can see there's a big difference between these two elements. Very important to have visual hierarchy, typographic, typographically speaking. All right. So I, another thing that you can do is to make your type more readable when you have lines of type, like a sentence uh, or paragraphs, is you can adjust what's called the letting, which is a fancy way of saying line height or the, the white space or the distance between your lines of text. So the area where you do that is right here. So I can left click and drag Typically, I advise for most fonts going anywhere from 120% to 160%. So I'm gonna leave like around 155, 155%, and that's pretty good. It just separates things out more. This right here is less readable than this, all right? So right around 155, I think is good. 
All right, so now the next element that is pretty typical is going to be the uh, call to actions, your primary call to actions and secondary call to actions. Um, before I get to that, I do wanna talk about alignment uh, and also white space. We have these two elements Newcomers sometimes will put them too close together. This is difficult to read. Just a difference of, you know, maybe 50, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 pixels makes a big difference. Putting it around here sounds pretty good. If you go down this far, it's gonna be too spaced out. So there's a nice sweet spot in here. And it's something that you will eventually develop an eye for the more you start to design. All right, now, alignment, another thing. I'm not gonna push this like right here. Remember, if I bring back, hit Shift R, our, our, our grid line, just align your type along the same column or the same row. Sometimes you can have stuff like right here or up here. We're gonna leave it right here. There are some times you can break these rules, but this isn't one of those times. All right, next up. And by the way, all this stuff is, is really con it's cemented in my UI UX design course, so you should definitely consider joining that. <laughs> all right, so let's go ahead and create our um, buttons, our primary and a secondary call to action. And again, a call to action or CTA is just a fancy way of saying a button or a thing that we want a person to do. So, you know, filling out an email, clicking on a text field and a form element, I, you know, clicking a button typically is the most common form of a call to action. So let's go ahead and we're gonna use the type tool, type T, and we're gonna say browse our collection. All right, hit escape by the way, your escape key to get out of that text edit mode. Now for this, again, visual hierarchy, because we have three pieces of type that are close to together, it's important that we separate them visually speaking to establish that visual hierarchy. So I'm gonna make it bold, all right? So we're changing it to bold, all right? So the font size of this right here, we're gonna leave it 18, so it's gonna be the same size, but it's gonna be a different font weight. Now, we could leave it like this, but I wanna give it an actual pill-shaped sort of uh, container, a button container. So I'm gonna hit R, which changes to the rectangle tool, left click, and then, Notice how it's on top of it. You can use your bracket keys on your keyboard. Hit the left bracket key to put it all the way to the bottom of the current frame. So that just basically means that it puts it right at the bottom automatically. If you use your, your right, your, the right bracket, it goes to the very top. So you can toggle between those with that right there. Obviously we want the button background to be behind it. So now we're gonna use a, uh, another color. Uh, I don't wanna use gray, you could use gray, but my subjective preference is to come out here and I'm going to use, uh, right here, around here, if you drag this little slider, kind of like in the orangish hue, and then drag this over here. I think that's pretty good. So that color code is F1E2D1 right there, okay. Notice we have document colors down here. It's automatically choosing some of our colors that we're using. I, if I get out of here, I'll show you something that's real, uh, it's a tip essentially. If we come over here and you wanna use, utilize this if you had a real serious project. I, right here is, it has these four little dots under fill. If we click that, we can click the plus button to create a style. So think of it kind of like a component for uh, things like colors or your font sizes and all that good stuff. Uh, so we could call this, you know, this could be like our secondary color uh, that we use in our design. And we could give it a description too. Um, hit create style. And then notice how it changes this area right here. And now if we had, for instance, let's just duplicate this this background, so you just hold Alt, Shift, and left click and drag over. Notice it says secondary as well. So if we change secondary uh, elsewhere, and by the way, we could do that by clicking here, and then see this, we can right click, edit style. Now we can change the, the actual color right there. So we only have to do it in one place, so that's very handy. 
All right, that's just a pro tip for you. Let's delete that one. Now we're gonna take both of these elements. You can just left click and drag around all of it to select them both. And we can go ahead and choose auto layout. And then right here, we want to center it. And doing that allows us so that if we want to change the size, it's, the type's always going to stay in the center, which is what we want. All right. Now I want to give it some rounded corners. Now that this is also a subjective design preference. You can have these uh, right angle corners. That's fine. If I select it, we can come right up here and left click. Sorry, you can't see it because my zoom tool's messed up, but you can left click and just drag this. A pill shape would be all the way, just left click and drag into the right, which is fine as well. I'm gonna make them a little bit less than that, probably around nine or so, or eight. All right, so with that selected, I think that looks pretty good. Might pull it out a little bit for more white space on all around uh, the button container. All right, so that looks pretty good right there. Notice I'm keeping these two elements closer together with the amount of white space between them compared to this. Because semantically speaking, this is kind of a different element. Uh, this is a, an actionable button that they can click. And so this is also referred to as grouping. Uh, but these two elements kind of work hand in hand. You're telling a story. First, you're getting their interest with good ad copy in your headline, and then they're gonna read a little bit more, and then they're gonna see this call to action button. So we, we separate them differently through proximity and white space, essentially. All right, now we can also have, oh, before we continue to the secondary call to action, which will be right here, I we can go ahead and take this and create a component out of it. And we can create a component variant out of that as well. All right, so maybe we're just gonna have a hover here where we change the background in a very subtle manner. Now notice this is tied to a actual um, asset here called secondary for our color. So we can break that, come over here, just make it a little bit darker. The color code for that is E4D2BC right there. All right. So it's just very slightly uh, darker essentially. So what we can do now is switch to prototype tab, double click here, drag this down, and then under our properties, this is going to be, uh, on click is gonna to change to while hovering. And we could use smart animate, but for this, typically I'm just gonna use instant just to change the background color real quickly. Now we're gonna drag this back over here. Oh no, not that. I meant this. There we go. I'm gonna put that right here. We're gonna drag this out. Again, you can go ahead and switch the design tab first. We can go ahead and shift alt drag that over. This is gonna be primary call to action. There we go. Go back to layers, select this. We'll double click this, change from the name from uh, frame three to CTA. I think that'll work. And then we go to assets and we'll drag CTA on here. So that way, when we hit play, if it's showing this right here, this little frame, you just at the very bottom, you click the right button. There you go. So now we hover over it and it changes the color. All right, awesome. Now let's go ahead and create another uh, call to action here. It's, this is referred to as a secondary call to action and we, utilize visual hierarchy between these two buttons to make this secondary. So it means it's not as important, but it's still important enough to put, all right? You don't always have to have a secondary call to action. It just depends on the needs of your project. So I'm gonna left click right here. We're gonna say spring 23 collection. All right. Now, we do have visual hierarchy already between these two elements. Why? Because this element right here does not have a button background. Your eye's just naturally more drawn to this because we have a unique color behind it and all that good stuff. We can further reinforce that visual hierarchy by changing this maybe to uh, regular. Or we could keep it the same up here and we can just choose light, all right? That's, that's fine as well. Now we can also add an icon. Sometimes buttons will have icons next to them, like a little arrow. Pro tip, a great easy way to create arrows in Figma 
is with the, the arrow tool. So Shift L is the shortcut for that. Hold Shift just to make it a nice horizontal arrow. And then if you come over here, we can take the thickness down all the way to one. All right. And so look at that. We can also utilize, if we take both of these, auto layout and leaving it right here. It was smart enough to know to put it in the center left. If we drag this out, it's not going to center it. So if we put it in the center, you'll see now it's gonna to stay to the center as well as the center this way. And this is fine as is right here. All right. Now I do want a nice cool, what's called micro interaction um, to occur here when we hover over Spring 23 collection. It's, and we're gonna integrate this as well in CSS when we get to that in that crash course video. And so what I want it to happen is when somebody hovers over Spring 23 collection, it's going to shift over this little arrow. So we can do that here in Figma, obviously as well in CSS when we get to that. So the way we do that is we take both of these elements, we're gonna go ahead and click create component up there. And once we have that, we click again up here to add a variant. And now we're gonna drag it back right here. Let's uh, give it a label, secondary call to action. All right, so we take this one. The only change we're gonna make is adjusting the white space. Boop, just like that. <laughs> Doesn't seem like a big change, but there's something satisfying about these little micro interactions for users when they hover over elements. It just kind of lets you know it's a clickable element. You could also, if you wanted to, I double click to select the actual type and then come over here and choose underline for decoration. So you can underline it as well. There's no, you know, it's just a, a subjective preference. You don't have to, but we're choosing to. So we're gonna double click to select this one, go to prototype, drag this down, create a connection. And this is gonna be once again, sorry, to while hovering. And we are going to smart animate that at 300 milliseconds. All right, so what we'll do now Switch back to design tab, go back to assets, and we also have right here our new call to action. We'll get this kind of in place right around there, just eyeball it. Or if you want, you know, you can hover over this and then hover over that and hit Alt and you'll or Option and you'll see 45. There's 45 pixels between these elements. Notice alignment as well. I'm not pushing this right up here. That looks silly. We want these two pieces of type to be right on the same uh, horizontal path. Now let's go ahead back to our tab. If you clicked out of it, um, the preview or the prototype play tab, you can click play again, of course, up here. So let's uh, zoom up here. Here's this one and here's that one. Look at that. Very nice. All right, we're moving right along. All right, so. There's one other element that I'm gonna have here. And again, it's one of those things that's entirely optional. Um, I'm gonna have like a little um, card as it's called. Cards in UI designs are patterns that you're gonna come to know quite a bit. Uh, and it's just like a way of saying that it's just like a, 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 like a rectangle typically that has information inside of it. And sometimes you'll have multiple cards next to each other and all this good stuff. Um, and so we're gonna have a card kind of like for an area where it just shows the latest news or something like that. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. So we're gonna hit R for rectangle. We're gonna left click and drag roughly the width of this current column. So that's established by the elements above it. So we have, it starts here and it goes all the way out to roughly right around here. So we can pull this out just a tad bit more and that'll be good. Okay. So for our card, we want rounded corners as well. And sometimes, you know, you might mix rounded corners, but this doesn't look good. These aren't as rounded as this. So consistency in UI design is also important. Consistency in the, the type that you're using, the colors that you're using, the fonts, 
also your border radius or your corner radius. Um, so what we're gonna do is make sure they're both even. So we're select up here, it says eight right up there. We're gonna make this one eight as well. Okay, now for our card, our card background. Very important that we establish good practice when it comes to contrast. Uh, people get this wrong often. And there's a lot of subjective, very good choices, but there's also a lot of objectively bad choices people can make. One of the core tenets of typography that I haven't yet talked about is contrast. And so I'm gonna show you a plugin which we haven't even discussed yet. There's a whole ecosystem of awesome Figma plugins that you can use to ensure minimum contrast adherence. Okay, so here's what I mean. Let's say for instance, we change this background color here and you don't have to follow along. I mean, we're gonna make it darker for some reason. We're not ultimately, but let's just say you decide you want like a mid gray. Then we're gonna have type on top of it. So I'm just gonna save myself some time. I'm gonna replicate this, hold alt, and just drag this over here. Right bracket key to get on top. And we're gonna have some type. Uh, we're gonna make this size 16, make it a little bit smaller. Put this over here. Uh, for me personally, I'm gonna copy and paste some type off to the side that I had. Actually, we're gonna change that to size 14. And we're gonna put it like right there. Now, the darker this background is, the more difficult it is to read this type. And I see people get this wrong so often in so many different contexts. For instance, here's another context. This is maximum contrast. You can't get any better than black on absolute white. But sometimes I'll see people do this. They'll change the font color to like a real light gray. It's like, bro, I cannot read that. Come on, all right. So how do you ensure minimum contrast? Well, there's something called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, and this is in the, realm, in the world of accessibility, which is very important to understand. It's one of those core principles to understand if you're a UI designer and you're responsible for piecing together the visual aesthetics of a layout. I, and the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, otherwise known as WCAG or WCAG, nobody says that, don't do it, and you'll embarrass yourself. Is it, it, it's a set of guidelines for accessibility on websites. And it's not just about contrast, but contrast is a very important part of it. And the contrast guidelines state that uh, a couple different things about contrast, and you want to adhere to minimum contrast guidelines uh, to have a truly accessible design, because they've gone through and they've done research, and not everybody has the same vision, right? Some people have a hard time seeing. So with that in mind, there is a plugin. Now, like I said, Figma has an ecosystem of plugins and you can browse those plugins uh, by coming up here to the little home icon, the very upper left most uh, corner icon. And we can come over here, you click on your username and click community. All right, and you can search through a bunch of stuff. It's more than plugins. There's also assets that people created for like illustrations and just everything underneath the sun. You can see all this stuff here. And a lot of it's free to use. Uh, and if, if we search um, under the community and we type in Stark, S-T-A-R-K. You've probably heard of that before, like the term Stark Contrast. Well, that's the name of this plugin. We can come right here where it says plugin and you'll see Stark, this one right here. So if you come over here, it tells you how many people have used it. Obviously a ton, 195,000 people. Uh, we choose try it out. It's gonna open up a new document and you can actually click run and you can give it a shot. But once we do that, we come over here back to our original design and we click on this little icon right here and we go to plugins. We can now choose Stark. We're gonna click run and we're gonna click run there again. There we go. So we, here's this little plugin. All these plugins have different UIs. Um, you can create your own plugins if you get to that stage. And we're gonna click contrast. All right, no, darn. You have to have a free account or to sign in. So it opened up the browser window on my other monitor. That's why you can't see it, but I'm logging in with my, my Gmail or my Google account rather. Go back to click that off. Let's go back to contrast. 
here it is. So with this type selected, notice we're, I'm gonna zoom up here. Notice how it says normal text and large text, all right? So it's it fails on all of these accounts. The color contrast ratio is 2.5 to one. No, so we really want that to be at least 4.5 to one. Large text, which I believe is anything, I'm probably gonna get this wrong, 22 to 24 pixels above. I You can actually get away with less contrast a little bit because it's larger text. Hopefully you understand that. Okay, so y this also gives you suggestions. So like if we do, I uh, oh, you have to be pro for that. Well, you don't have to buy this plugin, but it can at least tell you if you're getting it wrong. And then you can also just be like, okay, well, at what point do we need to drag down this color right here? Let's remove that, click on contrast. Ah, now it adheres to it to 4.77 to one right there. All right, so for me personally, <clears throat> we're gonna make this background completely white or just get rid of the background color, but we're gonna give it a stroke. All right, there's nothing wrong with adding a stroke. So I'm gonna leave it with a high contrast black stroke. And we're also gonna leave that text right here, black. Again, 21 to one ratio. So the higher the ratio or the bigger discrepancy between those two numbers, the better ultimately. You never wanna go under that normal text uh, ratio of 4.5 to one. Okay, so now we're gonna put an, another piece of type and we're just gonna put like 50K no, we're just gonna put 50K, there we go. And we're gonna click this little uh, auto width right here. It's gonna, which simply means it's the width of, this little bounding box will be the width of the text that's in. Otherwise, if it's not, you know, we do something like this, it's gonna do that. Okay, so it says 50K, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna make this type larger. So uh, the size of the type I think that we're gonna use is 33 or so. All right, so I personally, hmm, think, so that's size 14. Yeah, that's good for now. Um, actually, I want more white space between these elements. So moving things over here. Okay, right around there is good. Notice how these are aligned along the same row, essentially. So if I shift R, bring down a row-based guideline, they're right there at the very same column, or not column, but row. Okay, so that's looking good to me. Now what we can do is I wanna add, to make these designs more interesting, I call them accents. And adding accents, like these graphic design accents can just make a design a little bit more lively, so to speak. And this is where the Figma community is gonna come in as well. So if we go back here to the home icon and we're still under the community section, I'm gonna type in confetti. Now they actually have some confetti plugins that you can use. I think this one I've used already. It says confetti is 39,000 people. I, I think that's the one I use. You can really experiment. But you can also search for all and there could be just documents people created with, with confetti. So you could do this with all sorts of things based on what you need, like for emoticons and just hand-drawn elements, just all sorts of cool stuff that you can just use uh, in your project. So if I go back here and I, 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 okay, I use the one called Confetti Genie. All right, so if I click it and click run, all right, here's how you use this particular one. Uh, we're gonna hit R to create like a rectangle and then we're going to click this button down here. It says generate with selected colors. I'm not sure what happens. Please select a frame. Oh, so this has to be turned into a frame. So we hit F, we have a frame now. Now we can uh, choose confetti. Uh, let's see here. Color palette is empty, please add color. Okay, there we go. Oh, actually, you know what? We'll use generate with random colors. There we go. Now we have some confetti over there. We'll close that out. I don't want this much confetti like over here because this is supposed to be, hey, we're proud to announce 50,000 employees, whatever. I uh, So what I'm gonna do is zoom up and I'm just gonna double click to gain access to one and then just like kinda, 
Well, let's see if we can ungroup that. There we go. Now we can just select a few of these. Maybe uh, maybe this section right here. Your results are going to look different, so just just select a few of them. Hit Control C to copy, and then Control V to paste. We're going to move them over here. Hit Control G to group them. Hold Shift, to scale them up. All right, and there we go. We have a little bit of confetti. Let's delete that. Just over here, and we'll integrate that with CSS as well. Okay, coming along pretty good. Here's our design so far with the little micro interactions. Looking good. Now we're gonna worry about the right column. So for the right column, like I said, we're gonna have kind of like a image gallery. They're gonna be cards, uh, cards with photo-based backgrounds of products, fictional products. So let's go ahead and create that. R on your keyboard, and we're going to position this, eh, right around there, a good amount of white space between these two columns. And again, we're gonna use the same border radius that we've been using around to keep consistent. That's eight. So we're gonna use eight over here up in this section with that selected. And then I'm gonna show you a really awesome plugin that I use almost every time. It's probably the most popular Figma plugin. It's called Unsplash. They have an associated website called unsplash.com and it's where you can use free images. 100% free, even for commercial, it's awesome. A very awesome resource. So with this selected, we're gonna come out here um, to our plugins and I, I have already used and searched for Unsplash, so it's gonna show up here for me. I'm gonna click Run. And then we can do an image search. All right, so if I put these too close together, we'll see them when I zoom up. And I'm gonna search for uh, shoes. All right, I'm gonna find a, a graphic of shoe, you know, that I like. I'm trying to find the one that I used during my reference project that's on my other monitor. And of course, I can't find it. <laughs> uh, maybe I just typed in shoe. Eh, let's just use this one. We click it. And guess what? It shows up. That is awesome. Very, very cool. So now what we can do is we can create kind of like a little card within a card on top of this. So let's just duplicate this. Control D to duplicate. Drag the copy down. Hold Alt. Left click and drag in. Alt would make it so that you know both left and right are being affected. Otherwise, if you let go of Alt, it's just gonna affect this side. Again, these, these keyboard shortcuts you'll understand as you, you'll bake it into your mu muscle memory as you keep on designing. Now we also wanna put equal white space all the way around from left, bottom, and right. All right, to check that, yeah, so I was a one off. My bottom says 11, the, the right and left say 10, so we can just use our keyboard down arrow key to push it down by one pixel. Now, another thing that's very important is, is when it comes to corner radiuses inside corner radiuses. This element being that it's nested inside of this element should not have equal or larger corner radiuses. It just looks dumb if it's even larger. So if they're larger, that doesn't look right. It just looks awkward, all right? So we wanna make it smaller. So we push it out maybe to like five. All right, now it looks like it scales proportionally from this to that. All right, next up, we don't need an image, so we can come over here and just click that. And the minus will just delete the image, and we're gonna make the background white. All right, so inside of here, we're gonna have some text. We're gonna have the product name. We're gonna have a product, very subtle product like description or category, and then the price. So let's go ahead, hit T. We're gonna say Foxica Sport. 33 is way too large, so our size is gonna be 16 in bold. We'll make it bold. Again, we're using Poppins for this. Duplicate that, Control D, or just Alt, Shift, and drag down. And then, again, we wanna have visual hierarchy between these two pieces of type. So to do that, we're gonna make the size of the running shoe type just two points, or yeah, smaller, 14. And it's also gonna be 
light, and we'll also make it not quite black, but darker. Again, you don't wanna go under that minimum contrast guidelines. So now I can double click this and say running shoes. There we go. Finally, we'll put the price. So I'll just duplicate this one, hold Alt, left click, drag over, $59. Actually, if this is supposed to be like Fox, like cheap stuff, like real cheap stuff, we'll make it 49. Okay, there we go. All right, so now we're gonna change this. It's gonna be light. And for the font size, we'll make that 18. By the way, you can change uh, numeric values over here by just clicking in. You can use your keyboard up and down arrow as well. Another tip. And so we'll leave that right there. I think that's pretty solid. Now we could take everything by left clicking, dragging around everything right there in that card and we will duplicate it. Now, I just noticed this card is just too big. We wanna make sure that this second card over here, there's gonna be two of them stacked on top of each other. Don't exceed our rulers like right here. So your end of your navigation typically will define that column. All right, and it's it's important to adhere to that for the most part. Now, if this were like a, kind of like a carousel as it's called, where you have things off to the side, you can ignore that and exceed those boundaries, but in this case, we don't want to. So how do we fix that? All right, well, if we could select both of them, we can kind of like select everything rather and like drag them in. You can see it kind of screws up our text and that's okay. Um, one easy, quick way of fixing that is just to drag this out. Make sure we can choose auto width right here. Do the same thing with auto width right there as well. Auto width there, there we go. All right, so now if we take this and duplicate it, control D, and then we go ahead and move this up. Move this with it. We can go ahead now, duplicate that, and you do wanna have equal white space between these elements, um, not just from the, this direction, but also this direction as well. So if I look at this, it's 23. If I look at here compared to there, it's 12. So we need to make an adjustment for that. So to do that, I think what I'll do is simply take this bottom one, we're gonna move it down. Now it's at 19. I just hit four just to get to 23. So now we have 23 um, from our row white space and our column white space. All right, so that means I need to take this one and just match them up down there as well. And then take this, match this up. Now, by the way, see these elements, like these little cards right here? These are exactly the same. You could create components out of those. You, you, I should have, <laughs> but I didn't. I. And so that, that, again, that just shows you the value. Somebody, you know, your boss might say, hey, I want a, a border around this. So it just means you're gonna have to take these three and add a border or something like that. All right, so now that we have that, we need to change these pictures and make those unique as well. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and with that selected, right click, go to plugins, choose, unsplash. That's another way to get to plugins. And I will type in sweater. We'll use that one. And then we'll also, for this one, we're gonna say jacket. All right, so for that jacket, we'll use this one. All right. Now, one final thing I wanted to show you that's very cool. <clears throat> Components can be also you know, quite complex. Like you can have all this, this whole thing can be a component itself. So with the selected, we could just choose component up here and let's create a component variant out of this. So we click the plus up there. Oopsie, don't move that. And let's let's really give ourselves some room with this frame. So I'm gonna move things around. We're gonna drag this up here. Oh, we need even more. I'm gonna move this all the way up. Okay. <clears throat> let's say for instance, when somebody hovers over this card, we want the background to grow slightly. So what we need to do is we're gonna select it and let's select the first one till you uh, get to the image portion where it shows the image. We're gonna go ahead and change this from 
fill to crop. Now nothing's gonna change, but we have to do the same thing here. So we change this again from fill to crop. And now we can take, if I zoom up here, we can take this outer, this is the actual image right here. We can move it around or we could scale it as well. So I'm just gonna hold shift and alt and then left click and drag and make it a little bit larger and then get out of there. So now we can go ahead into prototype, selecting the top card, drag a connection. This is gonna be while hovering. Smart animate, 300 milliseconds, that looks good. Now we can go back for our assets. We can drag that on back to where it was. And again, you wanna make sure you have proper distance. So I think this is you know pretty close. Yep, 23, it's perfect. So now let's take everything as well. By actually, let's just take our canvas uh, or a frame rather and move it. Now, sometimes when you move or you size a frame and there's stuff inside it, like we have all this design, it'll move things around. It's not happening now. If that happens and it's like it's distorting something, just hold control while you do that, and it will ignore all that stuff from happening. Okay. So now what we can do is go back here. Look at that. You can even do other stuff too, for instance, which we will do in CSS. What if we wanted this to move up slightly, like this little card thing? Well, we want everything. So we're gonna take all three holding shift. So we have four elements selected, three pieces of type in the background and maybe just move it up a little bit. So now if we go back, look at that. Let me zoom up so you can see this. Very, very cool. So we have all of our micro interactions I'm up here. And now that is essentially it. So I uh, hopefully you learned a lot. Uh, there's obviously a lot more to learn, but this is a crash course and it's already been quite lengthy. And now I want you to watch the front end development HTML CSS crash course where we take this exact design and I'll show you from scratch how to make it a working reality in the browser. Again, if you're watching this at the time I launched this video here at the beginning of 2023, it may not be, that video may not be out yet, but look at the top uh, description and also the top comment. Um, and it's gonna be coming out within a week or so of me releasing this video. So as always, make sure to subscribe. I seriously suggest you all consider joining uh, designcourse.com, my UI UX course. If this is something that you enjoy and you really think you can tackle, and trust me, anybody can tackle this uh, if you try hard enough. And so my UI UX course is interactive and there's so many different examples, layout examples, component-based examples, all in Figma that will help you have a successful UI UX design career. All right, I'll see you all soon and goodbye.